Today, we are talking about how to escape founder-led sales for agency owners. So if you are an agency owner and you want to get out of founder-led sales, you want to delegate that to your team, this episode is going to be really helpful for you. My guest today is Corey Quinn. I'll tell you more about him in a second, so stay tuned. Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we feature top entrepreneurs, business leaders, and thought leaders, and ask them how they built key relationships to get where they are today. Now, let's get started with the show. All right, welcome everyone. John Corkin here. Thanks for tuning in. I am the host of the show, and you know if you've listened before, which of course, hopefully you have, we've had all kinds of great guests on this program, including um, CEOs and founders and entrepreneurs from companies like Netflix and Kinko's, YPO, EO, Activation Blizzard. We've had Redfin recently. We had Grubhub. Go check out the archives. Lots of great episodes in there. And if you are interested in the topic of uh, how to grow and scale an agency, a digital agency, um, Carl Smith is a great past guest I had on there, David C. Baker. Mm -hmm. Roger yeah. Herney, go check out the archives. You can look for some of those episodes and, and find them in the archives. And of course, this episode brought to you by Rise25, my company where we help B2B businesses to get clients referrals and strategic partnerships with Done For You Podcast and content marketing. And you can learn all about what we do by going to our website, which is rise25.com or email us at support at rise25.com. All right, and I'm excited about today's guest, introduced to me by my business partner, Dr. Jeremy Weiss, who introduced him. And his name is Corey Quinn. He's a Fractional CMO and go-to-market strategist, Corey Quinn, Inc. is the name of his business. Uh, he's also a seasoned entrepreneur. Uh, he and I graduated from college uh, the same year. Um, both went to UC California, different campuses. He went to Santa Cruz. I went to Santa Barbara. And he's a um, seasoned entrepreneur, sales leader, marketing executive for about 25 years. He's kind of found his niche in helping um agency owners to get out of founder-led sales, as I mentioned in the preview. And really fun fact, in his last agency, Scorpion, where he was CMO, he and his team took revenue from 20 million to 150 million in just seven years, which is a phenomenal result. So we're going to talk all about what that was like. And also be sure to check out his podcast, which is the Vertical Go-To-Market podcast. And he's got a forthcoming book that's going to be coming out soon, which we're going to talk about in a second. Corey, it's such a pleasure to have you here. And I want to start with i love to hear about how people were as a kid and these little like businesses that people start uh right and left and uh little fun stuff that you play around with and you were the neighborhood geek squad uh growing up in in a neighborhood of la you had <laughs> yeah. neighbors who were asking you like ah, my printer doesn't work my inkjet doesn't work and you came down and, and helped them out uh, with their gateway or their dell or whatever i imagine so tell me about what that was like and how you got into that yeah, so I um, at a very early age, my my parents bought me an Apple IIe, and I was sort of nice. raised on the uh, on the computer. Learned how to play games and, and code in Basic, and so I was sort of a, a real natural when it came to technology, and um, began to uh, be, you know just get random requests from folks whose printer was offline, or you know they couldn't dial up to the internet, or they're having str they're struggling with AOL back in the day, whatever that was. And so that uh, that led to me running this little uh, this little business that it was basically just me. And I would put flyers up around the neighborhood, uh, you know, letting people know that if they are having a challenge when it comes to their uh, their printer, their computer, Internet, anything that they can call me. And uh, yeah, that kept me uh, pretty busy nights and weekends. It was pretty good. Pretty good gig. So some real grassroots founder led sales there in those That's early it. days. Did, did, were, were people calling you off of these flyers you put up on the on telephone poles? They were. They were. And it was it was sort of within a very small radius of my house. So I wasn't I uh, wasn't going too too far out. But it, it definitely, like I said, it, made, it kept me busy and it, gets, uh, it gave me some nice pocket cash. And were your parents happy about this or were they like, whose house are you going to? Right. Like, what? <laughs> some random person who called this you because is, of a flyer this is uh this is between high school and college so i was not okay. uh i was not right. a, 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 a super junior kid running They're around these random houses. probably just happy that you're making some money and uh so yes. you go off and you were a, a proud banana slug um yes. at uc santa cruz uh, where my sister-in-law leanne went and um mm. i went to uh santa barbara and um you know <laughs> what i think is really amusing here is um you know this is natural. It was in the dot com boom. Uh, you're in Northern California. Um, like every kid who gets a BA in cultural anthropology, the next step is let's start a dot com. And so you go and you raise <laughs> six million bucks for something called Cast Pro. What was Cast Pro? 
Uh, first, before I mention that, we should talk offline about uh, the the crew at Santa Barbara because I had a ton of friends who all came from my school, the schools I grew up with, all went up to Santa Santa Barbara. So I bet we, we probably know some people game. in common. Yeah, that's yeah. it. That's it. So we'll have to do that it's, uh, so after the uh, after the interview. But yeah, so I coming from a technology background, I, I um, made a, a family friend uh, who was also very technologically sort of savvy, and we were both very eager to launch a business. We wanted to raise a bunch of money, and the impetus behind it was this idea of webcams. So um, the, the, back in the day, they're still around today, where you could log into a specific website and look at, through a, a camera through the internet. And so, okay, so not we the had, webcam that we're talking on right now, but like webcams that are trained on the national park or something like that, or a surf break yeah. or something. Okay. Yeah, it, it was. And so for us, it was uh, it was bars and the, bars, the big idea. Okay. <laughs> the big idea was well naturally you were in college so that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so the big idea was we would have a network of bars that would be uh that would be online you can go to our website and check out like what the what's happening at the local bars before going out to see if there was a scene there if it was empty and so on and so forth okay, okay. what we learned what we learned what we learned pretty quickly was that the bar owners were not that interested in having uh live streams coming from their bars for various reasons as you can imagine but Ultimately, that wasn't the idea that helped us to raise the money. What what it was was, uh, we 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 adopted this idea from um, news vans. So you you know like these these news vans that have the telescoping yeah. pole that yeah. goes up with the with the antenna. Well, it turns out about that time there was a uh, an innovation in uh, microwave technology, which was digital microwave, which allowed us to be able to uh, shoot live video on location. Uh, encode it on location and then stream it wirelessly to a server it could be broadcast out. And so the this, idea this is was, really interesting because yeah. my father actually was in TV news. He was with uh, KCAL nine. He was an entertainment reporter in, in the nineties. Nice. You, you probably around the time you were there. Yeah. Um, and um, I don't know if this is related to this, but there was a change. I don't know if it's in the law or what, but um, we were big fans of the, now the Washington commanders. Uh, then the yeah. Washington Redskins. And yeah. so was my dad's boss at this news station. Hopefully I'm not getting him in trouble all these years later. But we used to go down on the weekends because it was hard to get NFL games from out of your market back then. But yeah. the boss could redirect these massive um, satellite dishes to watch. Like literally like they had to redirect these massive satellite dishes to be able to see a game on, yeah. that was happening that was not being broadcast in Los Angeles. Yeah. And so we yeah. used to do that. But then I remember a couple of years after that, it became a lot easier to do because of changing shifts in either the law or technologies. Probably a little bit of both, but yeah. the, the the technology was rapidly changing at that time. Everything was being digitized and that allowed us to uh, do take this crazy idea of doing this like streaming media on, on location streaming media and applying it with like a new, like a news truck idea. And we ended up uh, raising a bunch of money I was the CEO. My partner was the chief technology officer, and we hired a bunch of people. We at least some office space here in West Los Angeles, and bought these trucks and you know fit them out with all this amazing broadcast quality equipment. And we ran the business. It was a, it was an amazing experience. It was who, a who lot were the of highs, clients? A lot then? of those. So if it wasn't bars, yeah. who did you end up selling this technology to? So we had a sort of a variety of clients, but um, if if uh, if I was to group any of them, it would be. Um, live concerts so we did k-rock weenie roast which is a big sort of yes. k-rock is mm -hmm. a big uh, uh, mm -hmm. news, uh radio station radio here in station, los angeles yeah. and every year they'd throw this amazing con concert with just like, all these headliners and so we got to be the be the company that came on location and would take the feed from the okay. concert and we, and we we would broadcast it live on krock.com okay. uh and we would do other types of um uh, live music events we also did things like city uh, parades like the the city of Garden Grove, they had their mm. annual Fourth of July parade. So we would broadcast mm. that to the local audience. No, this is ninety nine, yeah. two thousand, two thousand one yeah. time period. This is kind yeah. of I think before broadband. This is before a lot of people have reliable internet. This sounds mm -hmm. really like a bit ahead of its time from a user's perspective. From the from the end consumer, did you find was that a struggle with getting people to be able to watch it? 
You nailed it, John. So the, <laughs> okay. the, challenge, the challenge was yeah. we were we were pumping out broadcast quality streaming media, but people were dialing up to the internet with a at the time a fifty six k modem, yeah. right? Yeah. The dial up noise that's that's yeah. classic now, and so the their ability to enjoy the stream was very very low, and so they would get a frame refreshed every couple seconds, and so it was mm. it was uh, it was not the right medium based on the the limitations of bandwidth. Interestingly, this is about the time when Mark Cuban sold his company broadcast cast.com mm. to Yahoo I think it was for 300 some odd million dollars um the difference for his platform is that it was all audio so it's mm. not 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 uh, as uh, bandwidth intensive if you look back on that I, I can see why you went after video you know mm. you say oh this is a revolution this is an amazing technology people are going to mm. want to watch video but you're just ahead of your time yeah. and if you made that decision maybe to pursue audio instead of video, maybe you would have been Mark Cuban. Do, do you say that to yourself or do you, you know, or is, is that a harsh uh, thing to even think back on? No, no. I mean, it was, it was, uh, I'll tell you, I remember back then my ego was huge and I was convinced I was going to be on the cover of fortune magazine is the next, you know, me and my partner, the next prodigies, you know, the future of, of the web. We had all these big visions for ourselves, which, um, which basically tells me now that I wasn't ready to, to build the kind of company that was needed. And so, yeah. um, it, for a certain, to a certain extent, honestly, my, my ego, my, it was really tied into the success of that. And when it did fail, it was, it was really hard on me. Yeah. Like I, I, uh, I had to sort of, um, uh, you know, really go through kind of a, an ego death, if you will. Cause I was mm. so excited about what, you know, what this could mean to me. And, and, and of course it didn't work out that way. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you look back, other than, you know, talking about the fact that you're just too early, yeah. You know, that the technology wasn't there yet. What are some other things you maybe, are there anything else that you wish yeah. you'd done differently? So I had one experience that um, I share from time to time, which is um, I had one of my best friends from my childhood. Um, his name is Max. And he was working in Hollywood at the time. He was building his career, working on movie sets. And he would work, he sort of made his way up, up that. And I had convinced him to come work for my company and effectively leave this other career behind. And uh, he ended up doing that. And um, through a series of events, he uh, he was not very happy there. And he was in a tough position where he was not happy with with uh, the company that he was now working with on my company. And he couldn't go back to his former sort of career. He kind of burned that bridge a little bit. And so that ended up ultimately ending our friendship and our relationship, uh, which is um, one of those things where, um, you know, businesses and money can, you know, are important in life. And I guess the lesson that I learned was that um, when you bring friends and family into business, especially higher stake businesses, um, you're, you're putting that relationship at risk. Yeah. It's a good lesson. Um, yeah. Now um, you eventually found your way into, you know, business development, sales and marketing for agencies mm -hmm. in, in kind of this, um, a period of time, um, this purgatory that you were in after the the business failed. You you said you had an ego death, and you kind of figure mm -hmm. out what you're going to do next. One of the stops along the way was you were working for ultra high net worth individuals working out mm -hmm. of the top floor in the highest building in downtown LA. Um, yeah. What what did you learn from that experience? That that just sounds a little bit nutty. Yeah, well, I fell in love with the idea and the concept and the, and really the skill and the craft of sales. Um, I learned that as a junior broker. So I left the dot-com world uh, for those who were around the world was on fire. Uh, companies were going out of business um, left and right. And so I really wanted to continue to build my career. And so I left the sort of the dot-com world as they called it. And I went into financial services and I was a financial advisor for Morgan Stanley. They called it Morgan Stanley Dean Witter back then. Uh, mm -hmm. and it was eventually recruited to go work over at UBS in downtown LA. And so I was, as you mentioned, I was working at a, um, at an, a super elite high net worth sort of private wealth group. I was like a junior guy on the totem pole. And, um, I got to see how people with, you know, a lot of wealth manage their money. I got to, I got to, you know, sort of a glimpse into that world. And I also got a glimpse into what it's like to run a team at that level. And I remember looking up at the person who owned this group, kind of ran this group for UBS uh, in downtown LA. And I remember asking myself, 
Um, really, is this the future that I want to have for myself? I knew that if I kept my sort of my nose to the grindstone, I worked really hard and I, and I uh, created a lot of value for this group. There was a good chance that eventually I could maybe even run this group over many years uh, or after many years. And I realized that while there, that is an interesting future and it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of benefits to it. Wasn't really what was for me. And so I realized I didn't want to, I didn't want that future. Uh, and so that it was at that point that I decided to go back to school and kind of hit reset a little bit for myself. That's when I went to USC to get my MBA. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. There's a lot of similarities between our experiences here. Cause I ended yeah. up going to law school, yeah. similar type of thing, had a setback in my career. So I'd, I went into politics, worked in the Clinton White House, speechwriter for a governor of California, um, mm. California, uh, Gray Davis, you know, was recalled. And, um, <laughs> you know, I was like, well, I'm going to get the heck out of this industry. I'm going to go back and do something as stable as possible, which is like practicing law. Um, <laughs> I don't think that's a stable industry at all anymore. But mm. at the time, I thought it. And so it's kind of interesting, the parallels here. Um, what drew you to working for agencies uh, in yeah. particular, and and also like helping with business development and sales. What sure, was it? Sure. I imagine you'd done a lot of sales for Cast Pro. Maybe there's something along, yeah. along the way that that drew you to it. So I did. Um, I did sales at Cast Pro. It was, it was effectively my role was to help build the business and to kind of you know do the sales piece. Uh, and I and I loved it when I was at Morgan Stanley and then Dean Witter. Uh, excuse me, and, and UBS. Uh, what what I was able to get access to was formal training in what they call consultative selling. And so they teach you how to, as a financial advisor, be able to uncover current situation, desired situation, how to create a plan based on where they want to go. And, um, and so I, I kind of fell in love with the the art of of sales. And as I was leaving business school, I wanted to step back into digital. I wanted to step back into online. Um, and in, in this case, the the uh, the company that ended up hiring me was a digital marketing agency that um, was run by a Harvard Business School graduate that uh, primarily focused on enterprise sort of deals for uh, selling SEO and PPC services. And my my job there at the time when I when I joined was uh, I was a B what they call BD or business development rep, and my job was to go out and and close business. Go get some business, kid. That's it. That's yeah. it. And so I love the sales aspect of it. And I also love the the strategy piece of it. So when you're going in, you're selling digital marketing or paid search, paid uh, paid social and, and SEO to these larger companies, you can't just talk about the the sort of the the, uh, the inner workings of the watch, if you will. You have to really help to contextualize what the strategy is, how it helps the overall business. And so I love that aspect of it. And I was actually fairly successful. I was able to lead the sales team in um, in quota attainment. I was the number one seller there for, I think, like 18 quarters. I was really uh, productive there. But then eventually... Um, I was getting restless and I wanted to, a new challenge. At that time, the business was, I had taken on some private equity funding and uh, they were building some software and I kind of transitioned my role into not selling services, but actually selling marketing software. So that was my kind of my first foray into sort of product marketing and and, and marketing into, you know, marketing digital type services. Um, and that uh, that was really exciting to me. Fortunately, they had a, that round of layoffs and I, I got let go. But mm. what I did from there was I stepped into another agency. This one was a pretty interesting one. It was it was uh, run by the ex-CMO of MySpace, uh, Mike Jones. And he was running basically an incubator in Santa Monica. And what they would do is they would bring in very early stage businesses, give them a bit of funding, and give them a lot of resources to help to scale up the business. Their claim to fame big name that they they helped to incubate was a company called Dollar Shave Club. And, not so uh, bad. Oh, yeah, not so bad, right? So nice. Sold for nice a billion dollars or whatever yeah. it was. Yeah. 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 Uh, and there was, there was dozens of others that were in there and they had started an agency that that I helped to kind of run and, and grow and, and, and uh, do that. And it was at that time that I was recruited by um, a recruiter in Santa Monica to go check out this company called Scorpion. Before we get to that, I, I uh, yeah. want to take a step backwards and ask you, um, you and I both graduated the same year. Um, yeah. Interesting, the parallels. So we both go to a UC, which is a public school, and yeah. then we go both go to a private graduate school, which, by the way, how crazy is that? You go from like the UCs where it's like, all right, the 75 of you wait in line. And if the <laughs> if they close the uh, the window because they're going to lunch, it's it's like Kafka esque. You have to like wait for them to come back, right? You know. And then you go to a private school, 
which I don't know if you had this experience. I'm sure you did actually at USC. Mm -hmm. I went to USF and it's like, they're bringing you like pizza at lunchtime. It's like, Oh my God. It's, you know, yeah. I definitely wouldn't want to go the other way around. Um, <laughs> <laughs> definitely a different dynamic for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But um, definitely you mentioned earlier, the ego death that you experienced and, yeah. and I experienced that when you have these ups and downs in your career mm -hmm. And one day everyone's calling and the next day they're not. And then all of a sudden you're back in a classroom. You got to you know, be, eat some um, humble pie during mm -hmm. that. You know, it's like all of a yeah. sudden your, your nose is in a book. Is, did you experience that? I don't think so. I always saw it as uh, a means to an end. And um, I, I knew that by doing, by doing the business school, I, by the way, I almost went to law school. I took my LSAT, uh, but decided not to go to law school. Smart decision. Um, <laughs> but uh but i saw it as a way for me in and you know uh being being kind of just uh frank here i thought it would be a great way for me to ensure that i would be able to have a baseline of of, of revenue or income coming into my family as a result of getting this degree which isn't always the case but that was kind of the the, the thinking behind it's kind of an insurance policy for myself that worst case scenario i'll go work for some large company that said, I was really interested in um, in helping early stage businesses. Uh, this was back when uh, I graduated at a time when commercial real estate was 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 buzzing. This was the thing yeah. that everyone was going into, and I was going into the dot com world. It was sort of right before the resurgence of the dot com world, and and so um, it was always something that um, uh, I was just focused on and I was kind of just going through kind of like college. Honestly, I was just focused on getting the degree and so that I can move on, get to the next step. Yeah. So the search agency and then later the um, agency that was founded by the uh, ex CMO of MySpace. MySpace. Yeah. Um, reflect back on those experiences and, and particularly as it relates to the work that you do in helping agency owners to get yes. out of founder led sales. So in both the cases, the search agency and um, uh, the the, the, uh, the incubator is called Science, and we called it Science Growth Labs, the agency. In both those cases, the founders were the rainmakers. Everyone was dependent on the founder of the search agency, who I mentioned was a HBS um, Harvard Business School graduate. He had direct lines into the CMO of Lululemon and to Remax and and all these great enterprise brands, and this other. Uh, this other uh, agency that I worked for, he had direct lines into a ton of businesses. And so there was, you know, despite us trying to build up additional sales through our own means, what we always defaulted to was, let's see what the founder brings in. And they were so talented at doing that. It wasn't until I found a company called Scorpion, as I mentioned, I was recruited to go work over there. And what I found was um, a business that was growing rapidly. They're doing about $20 million. They had an eight person sales team. They all drove nice cars, made a lot of money and, and didn't have to work very hard. And the reason why was because they had a, the, the phone was ringing off the hook. I mean, not, not literally, but it was all these inbounds coming into the sales team and they were able to do a one call close. They even had a big metallic gong on the sales floor. And every time it was a one, one call close, they'd hit the, hit the gong and be high fives all around type of thing. And it was <laughs> this really cool thing, but um, the, the, the distinction that was different about uh, Scorpion that that was different than all my other agency experiences were that the people who were hiring Scorpion didn't know who the founder was and didn't care. It was not a part of their buying buying process. Was it so because was they had was, sold? Were they still involved in it, but they just weren't involved in sales? Where, where was they just the were not? Yeah, the founder was there. He was yeah. It didn't matter. He was he was doing other things okay. and. Um, and what, what that was is that again, by the time I, I joined, they had already built a name for themselves or were building a name for themselves in the, uh, the, the law firm industry. They had focused a lot of the business into concentrating on, on getting new business from personal injury attorneys. And the way that a personal injury attorney would look, they're super, a lot of them are very super, uh, competitive and they want to dominate their cal, you know, their, 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 their category or their, or their neighborhood. And so they'll search up their competitors and see what their competitors are doing. And they'll end, eventually come across a Scorpion website, a Scorpion mm. client website. At mm -hmm. the bottom of the Scorpion client website would be a link to the Scorpion, uh, Scorpion's website should eventually end up in a phone call. And so mm. um, as a result of this expertise, what it turns out that these attorneys were really, what they really wanted is 
uh, a partner who could help them to grow their practice. That mm-hmm. did not include knowing the founder of Scorpion. Did, that was not that was not a buying criteria for them. Yeah. Now, uh, since I practice law, I yeah. know that one of the challenges in selling to lawyers is that lawyers, for whatever ridiculous reason, <laughs> would rather buy marketing from another lawyer. How did you sure. overcome that challenge? Yeah, I think it was in, in the case of Scorpion before I had arrived there. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of the startup story behind this agency was they, uh, a couple guys, they just got the yellow pages and they started going through the, uh, the A's and they got to attorneys and they were cold calling attorneys seeing if they wanted a website and they got a lot of attorneys and eventually, so ended, yeah, <laughs> we're good. We're done. We can just stay yeah, here. They stayed busy. Exactly. Yeah. And as a result of that, um, there was enough, we, you, you can call it like social proof or evidence that Scorpion was okay. uh, good it. enough at providing results to overcome that objection. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and honestly, there was at back of the, back in these days, I joined in 2015, the agency started in 2001. And so um, a lot of years the, of, exper- of uh, proof, a, sort of proof. Yeah. a lot of, a lot of years. And there weren't a lot, yeah. right. There weren't a lot of the, a well-known attorneys who were also providing marketing services today. That's different, but um, yeah, so there, yeah. there wasn't, that wasn't a big competitive threat. Got it. Got it. Um, you gave away a Tesla. I did give away a Tesla. So the, what was that? Uh, what was that like? Tell me. Yeah. So one of the markets that we eventually targeted was uh, franchise, which are lo- multi-location businesses, obviously. So you you have these franchise brands that have maybe 100, 300, 500 franchisees locations. And so what we would do from a business perspective is that we would we would target the franchisor and we would get the entire franchise business. So it was a relatively high dollar figure account for us to go in. Well, it turns out that all of these franchise brands would 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 accumulate, get, get together in, San, in, in uh, Las Vegas every year at a conference called IFA. And so we knew that we wanted to make a splash for ourselves. We wanted to make a name for ourselves in the franchise industry. We had a couple of relationships, but we were unknown, completely unknown. And so I came up with the idea of giving away a Tesla because we knew that if we could draw enough attention, we get enough opportunities, Mm -hmm. we close a deal or two, it would by far pay for the Tesla. So you knew exactly what you needed to do in order to make it work. Yeah. And there were, there were hundreds of prospects at this, at this, uh, at this conference and we only needed to close one or two. And eventually uh, we went from zero franchise clients to over a hundred franchise clients in about two years. So we, we blew up that business. Did you figure out the ROI on that one Tesla giveaway? It was very good. (laughs) Very good. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> worthwhile yeah, i mean i've heard yeah. other people do those sorts of kind of you know big giveaways <laughs> say that oh yeah. we regret that we did it so that's good to hear i yeah. think at the time it was it was no one was doing anything close to it was a kind of a sleepy uh conference no one was doing anything a, a big or above and beyond and so what what we did is we literally brought the car to our booth it parked it there and in or- nice. <clears throat> parked it there yeah and then we held a, a live raffle on the third day and the wow. last day of the conference that you had to first off, go to our booth to get scanned, to be entered to win. And on the third day, we would ro- we basically pick a name out of a hat and you had to be present on that day. If we called your name, we'd give you the keys to that car. Wow. So what was that it, like? It was, it was electric, as yeah. you can imagine. The yeah. entire conference shut down. Everyone was at our booth, like literally thousands of people standing around our booth l- wow. waiting for their name to be heard. It was a, it was a, it was a big moment. Wow, that's so cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's really neat. Um, and uh, what are some other just kind of like pivotal turning points if you look back yeah. at that period of time in your career for 20 million to 150 million? That's an insane result in seven years. What were some other you know key things that you could put your finger on that made the big difference in that period? Yes, it's a good question. We we um we worked so hard. I mean, it was the entire company. We grew from literally 100 people to 1000 people. And you can imagine just the uh the amount of cha- internal change that's required in order to be able to uh you know, manage that kind of infrastructure uh and and so there was uh, just a lot of constant change and and some people really love that and thrive on that. And other people, it's just not the right thing. And so I think one of the things that um, I learned, which is critical to in business is um, culture. And a lot of people talk about it, but I saw it firsthand where it was really clear whether or not you were going to make it at Scorpion because you had to want to work hard. You had to want to play hard and you had to be super comfortable with change. Like 
rapid, big change in, you know, constant succession. So um, the, the people who love that thrived and the people who didn't, you know, they struggled, they, they go on to something else eventually because it wasn't the right place for them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what led you to decide that it was time for you to step aside from that, uh, that rocket ship? Yeah. So the business was still growing. We were complicating our, our world a little bit and that we were um, wanting to build software. We eventually brought in a private equity partner, minority stake, but a private equity partner to help fund uh, a lot of the growth. And at that point, things started changing rapidly. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that was kind of a, after a while, that was a signal to me that um, maybe this is my time to uh, move on to something else and, and uh, go explore some of my other interests. Um, yeah. Mostly being mostly wanting to get back into the entrepreneurial pursuits. Yeah. And so talk a little bit about um, how you decided to focus on um, the founder led sales, helping digital agencies yeah. to get out of that. So what I what I've found at my time across my entire career, but also just at Scorpion specifically, just the power of focus how and, and how it was is instrumental in really creating a lot of the scale that a lot of agencies that I've seen um, struggle with. And since my time there, I've, I've interviewed dozens of um, agency owners who like Scorpion focused on a vertical and has seen a lot of growth, a lot of success. They maybe have sold their business for great valuations. And so um, I really wanted to find a way to uh, to study that and to get good at helping other agencies, maybe who are more of a generalist, who are serving businesses of all shapes and sizes, who are struggling with scaling and, and getting to the next level, really helping them to leverage, again, my experiences at Scorpion, but also before and after that, to help them to transition um, their business from a, from a generalist to a vertical market specialist. Mm. And um, and that you have you've kind of wrapped yourself around this idea of the deep specialization. Um, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about some of the challenges that um, you come across with the agencies you've worked with that um, yeah. haven't specialized enough. Sure. So this there's this idea, and I believe in it. It's like the riches, uh, the, the riches are in the niches, right? And mm -hmm. this idea of niching now is very popular. A lot of people talk about it because it's powerful. It's a great principle. I think the thing that separates the agencies who do it well from those who don't are the ones who are dabbling in niching down, meaning, well, there's a lot of attorneys. We'll put up a page on our website. We'll put together some copy and, and a really strong sort of offer with a great guarantee. And we'll see how it goes. Um, I've seen that fail a lot. And what I see work really well differently is to, um, to find an industry or a vertical that the founder actually um, has some level of uh, emotional investment in. Uh, mm. It could be because there's a familial relationship, uh, meaning like someone in the family is an attorney in this case, uh, or maybe in someone in the agency is an ex-attorney uh, and, and there's some, there's some uh, depth to the, uh, the interest in, um, uh, in targeting a vertical because you know, the, the focus is one thing and the strategy and how to grow an, an agency a targeting attorneys is, is, is all well and good, but you really, that third ingredient, which is, uh, which is really the care, um, is what's needed in my opinion, to really create long lasting results through this idea of specialization. Mm. Um, I, I didn't prompt you beforehand. I usually uh, warn my guests beforehand, but I'm going to ask it anyways. So sure. I have a final question that I ask, and I think you'll be mm -hmm. fine with it. Um, so I'm a big fan of gratitude. I'm a big fan of expressing gratitude, especially- I knew this was coming, by the way. I've okay. been listening right. to your, listening to your episode, then. so I'm good. You're good then. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I'm a big fan of kind of expressing gratitude, especially to- um, you know, those peers and contemporaries, um, maybe mentors that, that helped you along the way. You mentioned business partners, you mentioned investors, you mentioned yeah. mentors. Who would you want to shout out and thank? Um, the first person that comes to mind when thinking about this question is my wife. And uh, the reason why she comes up, it's funny, actually, before I started at Scorpion, um, I was at this other agency, uh, this company science, and I was entertaining offers from a number of companies. And I remember there was two companies that I was looking at. One was Scorpion, the other one was this other business. On paper, this other business was the, the sure thing, right? It was the right thing for me to do, but there was something about Scorpion. And I remember we were, my wife and I, we were in a, uh, a heated discussion 
uh, over dinner in Santa Monica at a at a um, at a Mexican food restaurant, high end Mexican food restaurant. I had a couple of margaritas. She was pregnant at the time, and I remember it just being like a real sticky conversation around like, hey. I know that this other company sounds great, but there's something about this company. And she was like, okay, I don't know if I, you know, you know, I am pregnant and I'm going to be, you know, we're going to be having a family. It would be nice to do something that's a little more conservative. In any mm -hmm. event, she ultimately um, supported me in this decision. And, and as a result of this decision, it obviously worked out really well for me. And throughout the years, and, and especially in this transition out of, let's say corporate life. I mean, Scorpion was a thousand person company. We we're doing $150 million. It's a rather, rel relatively stable uh, gig. Uh, she supported me in this, this new entrepreneurial pursuit every single day. She is there with me and she supports me and allows me to do things like write a book and to um, really go deep on, on the work that I'm doing. So yeah. she's, she's someone I'm just extremely grateful for believing in me and, and, and uh, giving me the space to to do the things that, I'm being called to do. Corey, this has been great. Um, the book is called uh, Anyone, Not Everyone, coming out, yeah. um, I believe, this spring, spring of 2024, as we record this, a couple of months away, the Vertical Go-To-Market podcast. Where else can people go to learn more about you? If you want to, uh, if you're an agency and you want to learn about how to um, niche down, grow, and scale through deep specialization, I invite you to come to my website. It's coreyquinn.com. And you can sign up for my daily newsletter where you'll get actionable tips five days a week. Awesome. All right, Corey, thanks so much. Thanks, John. Thanks for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes. <laughs>